some of our history, but from the statements of Nobel laureate economists and management scientists like Julian Simon, that the real source of resources is the human mind. Don't worry, all is in hand. All we need to do is to respond to these crises one by one and we will pull it off. The current way of pulling it off is through efficiency gains. It's almost an article of faith that by gaining in the material productivity, we've got this one wrapped up. The problem is that we have known for well over a century that increasing the input-output ratio for goods and services doesn't necessarily mean a reduction in resource use. So even if you achieve a much higher level of productivity, in other words, you produce two computers with the same amount of resources that used to be needed for just one computer, doesn't mean that you're only going to produce one computer with half the resources. What are you going to do instead? Produce the two computers. Supposing each of you t sells your old beater and buys a more fuel-efficient automobile. Suppose you save $1,000 a year in fuel costs. Now, if you want to have a contribution to the ecosphere, you tear up that money and throw it away. But if you use it to take a flight to Paris, you might as well have kept your old beater. The World Resources Institute looked at the six most efficient economies on Earth. And in each case, over a 10-year period, they were making steady gains in the efficiency of their energy and resource use. However, growth overwhelmed those gains, so that even though they were gaining steadily in efficiency, and even though there was a slight decoupling from each unit of GDP and energy and material use, this gain was overwhelmed by increased consumption overall. So that in every one of those five or six most efficient economies, total consumption of energy and material rose, per capita consumption rose, and the total output of waste increased. Growth, even in already obscenely rich societies, is sacrosanct. This central value won't really change until it's discredited by some kind of major shock, which probably means some kind of system breakdown. Thomas Homer Dixon, political scientist. There is, abroad in the world, this idea of perpetual economic growth. I don't think any of you would deny that continued economic growth is the primary social and economic policy of every country on the planet. Uh, certainly, we've not seen any politician in this country suggesting that perhaps economic growth has taken us too far, and it might be time to be thinking of backing off a little bit. So behind this vision is the idea that ever-increasing income is somehow associated with ever-increasing human well-being. And that's a question that we have to now very seriously begin to uh, reinterpret. There have been thousands of generations of people, but exactly seven of those generations have experienced continuous economic and population growth. Seven generations out of thousands. So that this period, which we all take to be the norm, because we've all lived through it, because our parents lived through it and our grandparents before that, is actually the single most anomalous or abnormal period in the history of humankind. It's almost entirely made possible by fossil fuel. Fish catches in the last 100 years are up by a factor of 35. Now, that's an astonishing increase. It would not be possible in the absence of fossil fuel. This is a technological uh, gain made possible by advances in technology driven by fossil fuel. Unfortunately, uh, the oceans haven't grown, nor fish populations by a factor of 35. About 75 to 80 percent of the world's fish stocks are now overexploited or at the limit of their rate of exploitation, and many are in a state of decline. Every single act of economic production is an act of consumption. So when you buy a product called a pound of cheese, it has gallons and gallons of milk, which are produced by cattle, which ate several hundred kilograms of grass to produce your kilogram or two of cheese. So I don't care what you pick, the same story 
is true. We produce stuff. We think of ourselves as being productive. One of the great laments of economists in Canada today is that we're falling behind in productivity. Well, that's another way of saying we're falling behind others who are consuming a great deal more than we are. The Earth as a whole is in ecological deficit. We're building up a huge debt to nature. We won't be able to repay it. If uh, a species disappears, if a fishery collapses forever, it cannot be rebuilt. So these are permanent inroads, permanent inroads on the future carrying capacity of the planet. This is a collective problem. It's a community problem that requires collective solutions, massive government interventions in the economy, in the country, and more international allegiances and institutions to ensure that the world community as a whole moves forward to solve these problems. What we're seeing instead is a fragmentation of unity at the global level in an era when we've uh, promoted individualism, competition, a trade, and the breakdown of international organizations as that uh, philosophy proclamates uh, through the world. You know, we've made uh, an anathema of pay paying taxes. Taxes are necessary. You've got now, because of this individualistic stuff, an enormous accumulation of private capital in the form of huge SUVs and so on and so forth, even as the, pr the public domain diminishes. We've got to redirect from private consumption to public consumption in order to get the kind of infrastructure in place that would enable us all to live sustainably. But now it's not even politically correct to talk about raising taxes. To my astonishment, last week, the business community in this country said to government, wait a minute, you should be raising taxes, not lowering taxes. So that's, I think, a hugely important turnaround. We should all be writing the prime minister asking a reconsideration because we do need to work on these mutually and unfortunately tax, we're undertaxed right now if we're going to solve these problems. What do you do as an individual to try to keep your consumption down? Well, to be quite honest, Bruce, there's not much you can do as an individual. And I think this is again one of the kind of little tragedies of this whole sustainability affair. The whole problem, again, because of the nature of our society, has been dumped onto the individual. You should cycle, you should walk, you should take transit, you should buy the hybrid vehicle, and so on and so forth. Well, actually, I do all of those things. I cycle to work every day of my life uh, for 37 years. I have a very small car. Um, I try to buy locally. I'm in constant battles with my local grocerieria or the, the, gross, the green grocer up here at the IGA over where he's getting his produce and so on. But it doesn't make any difference. If we added up all of those little individual things that people can do, it creates great effort for a maybe a 3 or 4% difference in our, our level of consumption. What needs to be done are things like ecological tax reform where we have a fiscal rearrangement so that prices tell the truth in the marketplace. A carbon tax or a cap-and-trade system would be part of that. I, as an individual, cannot implement a cap-and-trade system around carbon. I, as an individual, can't leave my car at home if there's no transit system in the city in which I live. We are engaged here in a huge collective battle. And I cannot, as a citizen, decide in my town that there should be a good rapid transit system. I cannot create a situation in which I don't have to drive you know, three miles to the milk store if the urban planning of this area has separated the shopping from the residential areas. If my job is 30 kilometers away because, again, bad planning has meant that house prices are unaffordable anywhere near where I work, that's not my problem. It's not something, it's my problem, but it's not something that I can solve individually. Much of consumption in North America is not necessary. It's a, a, a created market that is for no particular utility, but it does cause damage elsewhere. Years ago, when we knew nothing of these mechanisms and the global implications of our way of life, we could say, well, who knew? And you might be excused for careless consumption patterns. But as the mechanisms become clearer, we no longer have the excuse and say, well, we didn't know that what would happen. We have an obligation to take appropriate steps to correct it. That is our moral duty to our fellow human beings and to other non-human species on the planet. And if we know these things and we choose not to act, if we insist on maintaining our existing lifestyle, if we resist the data 
that are quite clear and, and becoming clearer by the day, then we make a conscious uh, decision to commit acts of aggression against nature, the rest of creation, and against other human beings. Negligence law focuses on compensation due someone who is damaged by your unreasonable conduct. Your unreasonable conduct is defined as your failure to do something that a reasonable person would do, or your failure to do something that a prudent, reasonable person would not do. So this is in the law. Everyone is criminally negligent who, in doing anything, or in omitting to do anything that it is your duty to do, shows wanton or reckless disregard for the lives or safety of other persons. And duty here is simply an obligation imposed by law. Why, if we live in a global village, should the standards that we apply to ourselves within our nation not apply across boundaries? There's no prima facie moral reason at all why the behavioral standards imposed by international law should not be as rigorous as the behavioral standards we impose on ourselves within uh, the country. If we know that we are the major or among the major perpetrators of climate change, if we know that this is beginning to cause major damage, do violence to other people elsewhere on the planet, and we continue to do it, then by our own legal definitions, we are guilty of wanton or reckless disregard for the lives or safety of other persons. We in the rich countries need to contract as the poorer countries grow so that we converge towards a universal standard of living which is sustainable within the planetary carrying capacity. In my language, it would mean that we have to go from seven or eight hectares per capita down to about two, while those countries living on a half a hectare rise up to about two. We actually have the technology to make about a 75% reduction in energy use, at least, in most applications out there today without even changing your quality of life. Those technologies exist right now but the right incentives aren't there to bring them into play. So what is wrong with us when we resist such things as carbon taxes, which might actually make this possible, or other changes in the uh, financial structure of the economy to bring on stream the competitive kinds of technologies or to make more competitive the technologies that will have this kind of effect. The good news then is that we could achieve enormous strides with existing off-the-shelf technology given the right incentives and attitudes of mind. The bad news is that we're not acting. What is ecologically necessary seems at the present time to be politically unfeasible. But what's politically feasible is ecologically irrelevant. If a species is no longer adapted to the ecological circumstances in which it finds itself, it will be eliminated. And there's nothing exceptional about that statement. It happens over and over again. So we have a choice here, and for the first time in our evolutionary history, it may be that we have to shift from recognizing or, or from emphasizing our individual short-term self-interest to a situation in which we see that as being identical to your interest. My interests are your interests. So my individual interests become the collective interest. I can best save my own future and those of my children by cooperating with all of us in a mutual effort to save the planet. And if we don't rally around that flag, if we don't recognize that our individual interest has now converged with our collective interest, I don't think we're going to pull it off in this century. Thank you very much.